கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to the exciting conclusion of Ananya Bhakti. This is really about the question that we started with and we're going to conclude with the same question because it leads right into the next series. And that question is what is Arunachala? Why do we worship a hill, a sacred hill, a holy hill? And in the beginning, I told the story of Arunachala, how Lord Shiva, to uh, mitigate a quarrel between Brahma and Vishnu, manifested as a huge lingam of fire. Now, of course, fire is plasma, and plasma is is the stuff that 99.99999% of the universe is made of. Most of the universe is highly charged energetic particles, not solid matter, energy. So this energy is the primal substance. Anyway, Shiva manifested as a column or lingam of this energy and he challenged brahma and vishnu uh, whichever one of you can find the top or the bottom is the superior one so vishnu turned himself into his boar form and he began to burrow down into the earth and beyond and brahma turned himself into his carrier form of a swan and he began to fly up and up and up So after thousands of years neither of them had reached the end and Vishnu said mm, something's off here <laughs> maybe I should go back huh so he came back and then Brahma was high up and still couldn't see the the uh, top but then he saw a flower floating down and he said hey flower how far is it to the top and the flower said I was offered to the head of Shiva and fell 40,000 years ago and I'm still falling <laughs> how far to the bottom <laughs> so brahma said oh boy you have no idea and uh, but you come with me and you tell you testify that i know the top through you so they went back and they met again on the earth and so of course vishnu said i couldn't find anything and brahma said well i know about the top because i heard from this flower and so shiva said oh you rascal <laughs> that's not the condition huh so uh he cursed brahma that of all of the the devas of all the demigods you will not get any worship and to this day there are only i don't know three or four temples of brahma in all of india i used to live right a couple of blocks away from one of them in kumbakona so then shiva in order to prevent scorching the earth planet he uh, retracted his form of fire and he became a hill and is this hill arunachala right here so <laughs> this hill is worshiped to this day i mean this the story took place who knows how long ago in pre vedic times puranic times and so every full moon which happens to be today thousands and thousands of people form a pilgrimage around the hill 
Some people go around the hill every day and worship it with prayers such as the Arunachala Shiva Dhyana uh, that we open this uh, series with. And so why is this now? What are they doing? Huh? Now, Ramana Maharshi appeared on the very day that this hill uh, is celebrated as Arunachala Shiva. And he is generally regarded by those in his line as being a direct incarnation of Arunachala Shiva. And he certainly demonstrated that in his life. I'm not going to go into all the details and stories and stuff. But uh, so he is venerated as Arunachala Shiva, as the form of Arunachala Shiva, Arunachala Shiva Rupam, uh, or Murti. So this is the, if you will, the cult of Arunachala. And uh, it's very, very esoteric, very hidden. Uh, many, many big pilgrimage places in India are quite public and open. But Arunachala, uh, not so much. Only uh, people who are kind of hip to the, the legend or who have a direct connection, a need for this level of teaching, this level of access to the self, uh, generally come here and uh, are connected with our Nachla. So this brings us back to our main question. Why did Sri Bhagavan choose to teach us the correct way of practicing dualistic devotion by composing verses addressed to and in praise of God or Guru in the form of the holy mountain Arunachala? That's the question that touched off this whole series and that we're going to be looking into that this time. A clue to answer this question is given by Sri Bhagavan in Uladu Narpadu, verse 4. If we are a form, the world and God will be likewise. If we are not a form, who could see their forms and how? Can whatever is seen be otherwise than the eye and consciousness that see it? We, that I, the formless consciousness, I am, are the limitless I, the infinite consciousness. So this is describing both bhakti and realization of the self. So when bhakti is connected with realization of the self, it's ananya bhakti. When bhakti is an expression of love between two individuals, the individual self or soul and God, then it's Anya Bhakti. And that's traditional, ordinary, uh, garden variety Bhakti. <laughs> but we're talking about a special kind of Bhakti. That is that one worships God as the self, knowing that oneself is also that self formless. Uh, so it is a question of how we define ourself, how we look at our individuality. Are we separate from God or are we deeply connected? As long as we continue to separate from our reality by imagining ourselves to be the form of a physical body, we cannot conceive of God except as a form until we experience him as our real self, which is the formless and therefore limitless consciousness, I am. We can know God only as a thought in our mind, and every thought is only a form, a mental image. A form and a name. That is why the name of God is so important, in, especially in the beginning of bhakti. So the name of God is chanted as a mantra. And here we've been 
uh, actually invoking this Arunachala Dhyanam mantra to uh, remind us, to, to spark our memory of this self expressed as this hill, Arunachala. Now, when most people look at Arunachala, <laughs> they just see a pile of rocks. <laughs> but when we look at Arunachala with the inward eye, with the eye of this I am consciousness, we see the same pillar of fire that is its original form, uh, Arunachala Shivam. So Arunachala Shivam means the primal energy. Remember we talked last time about how Shiva, by imagining ignorance, creates the primal vortex between yin and yang. So this energy is the column of fire or plasma, energetic matter, which is brought into existence by this process of vibration, uh, the vortex of creation. So of course, from this vortex, everything else manifests. Therefore, it is the source of everything that we could ever want and more. <laughs> Therefore, we worship Shiva as Arunachala. And when he became uh, the hill form, when he cooled down his fire, then Devi came and prayed to him, uh, you please manifest a form which is half you and half me, half yang and half yin. So she circumambulated him to get that boon. And that is how the custom of circumambulating the hill began. It's called Giri Pradakshana. And we do that here as a regular thing. <laughs> so let's look into this difference between form and formlessness. Though we can imagine God to be formless, that imagination is still only a thought, which is a form that we have created in our mind. So by imaging him thus, we cannot experience his true formless nature. We can experience his formless reality only by turning our mind inwards and drowning it in the absolute clarity of our self-conscious being, which alone is his formless reality. So we don't see God on the outside unless we build a temple and make a statue and all of that. And that's okay too. But we don't see him in his formless nature with these eyes. We can only see him with the eyes of the inner vision, which is cleansed of form and name. This is the purpose of meditation. This is the purpose of bhakti, to reach this deep state. So what does Sri Bhagavan say about this in Uladu Narpadu? He says, know thus, whoever worships the absolute reality or God in whatever form, giving it whatever name, that is a path or means to see the nameless and formless reality in that name and form. However, becoming one with that reality, having carefully scrutinized or known one's own truth, essence, or beingness, and having thereby subsided or dissolved in the truth, essence, or beingness of that true reality, is alone seeing it in truth. So this is the process of Raja Yoga and Jnana Yoga. Raja Yoga means dissolving the outward form, the senses, the mind, the ego, the personality, and all the thoughts that go along with that. Conceptions of space, time, location, motion, action, cause and effect, and so on. And going into that state 
which is pure consciousness without an object. And of course, this is probably best expressed, at least in my experience, in the teaching of the Buddha. The eight jhanas, or meditative states, leading towards nibbana, or enlightenment. So when one practices these, one comes to that original consciousness, which is without objects, without division, without limits, without identity, and so on and so on. In other words, Brahman. But when one realizes that one is Brahman, that is the penultimate step. And then the next step is coming out of that oneness, the word, so I should say, non-duality. <laughs> There's no two-ness to compare it to, so how can we say it's oneness? Coming out of that state of full identification with the ultimate, original self, and then turning around and worshiping it as God in whatever form, with whatever name, and there are thousands and millions of names and forms of God. Now, small-minded people will fight over this, and they'll say, no, only my version of God is true. Well, that's fine for you. But everyone can have and should have a unique realization of God's name and form. And that's what bhakti is really about. Raga Nuga Bhakti, spontaneous bhakti without rules and regulations, where one realizes one's personal taste in relationship with God and then follows up on that until one can actually merge into the existence of God as the self. Until we know our formless reality, we cannot experience the formless reality of God and therefore we can know him only as a form. All forms of dualistic devotion are directed to God as a form of one sort or another. So we have all these different cults of different forms of God. Arunachala is only one of them. Huh? But it's the one that we feel the most attracted to because of the presence, his incarnation, as Ramana Maharshi. Now, I've mentioned this several times, but I'm going to bring it up again. Ramana's qualifications are unique in history, especially modern history, as one who attained the highest state of enlightenment spontaneously at age of 16, without any instruction, without reading any scriptures, without any training in meditation, uh, sadhana, puja, or yoga, or any of that. Just, it happened one day. You can read the story on the internet. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. But Ramana attained the highest enlightenment spontaneously. Now, some teachers, like Osho, claim they attained enlightenment without a guru. But if we dig further into Osho's life, for example, we find that he actually had three gurus in his early days. Uh, and he talked openly about that in the beginning of his career. But once he attracted a large following, they began to try to, to boost him up, you know. Oh, he attained without a guru. And this often happens. We see this when uh, a teacher begins to establish a large following. They want to make him into something more than simply a man who has realized. Huh? But actually, the realization experience described by Osho, and very often alluded to as his moment of enlightenment, was actually first path realization according to the Buddha. So first path is wonderful. First path is very nice. Huh? But it's only first path. I experienced the same thing in 1984 after a couple of years of studying with Osho, living on the ranch in Oregon. So 
you know, from any point of view of deep knowledge of the path. I mean, he may have made more advancement later, and I, I certainly hope and think that he did. But anything or any state that relies on an experience is still duality, because there's a difference between the experience and the experiencer. So Bhagwan uh, Ramana's enlightenment was not like that. His state, what he attained, was purely subjective, and it was deep. He would go into samadhi for days, forget all about his body. In fact, Sheshagri Swami had to literally uh, have him picked up and taken out of the cave where he was meditating and taken to the hospital because insects were eating his body and he was totally unaware of it. So in this way, Ramana showed the highest qualifications of anyone since maybe Jesus. Uh, so it's very hard for me personally to accept anyone else as the ultimate guru. Now, I have gained very much benefit from many teachers, including Osho and Prabhupada and Jnananda and so many. Uh, but as far as the guru who gave the highest realization, only Ramana. And he gave very freely. And this is my experience, that when one meditates on Arunachala, when one prays to Arunachala, that he gives almost immediate results. You have to try it. If it works for you, that's great. Otherwise, maybe he's not the right door. Maybe you have to find a different door, one that works for you. Uh, and that's fine. But I want to share what works for me and has been such a wonderful experience just this last six months. But since God exists as an image in our mind, is it not sufficient for us to direct our feelings of dualistic devotion towards our mental image or concept of God? Why did Sri Bhagavan choose to exemplify the practice of dualistic devotion by praising and praying to God in the physical form of Arunachala? Because he was the incarnation of Arunachala. And just as he attained a deep state of enlightenment spontaneously in his early youth, he was also spontaneously drawn to leave his family and come to Arunachala and renounce everything, surrendering completely to Arunachala as the presence of Shiva. And so in that way, he simply manifested his innate tendency. Uh, this was his nature at age 16 without any instruction. So it's up to each one of us to find the form of God, the name of God, and the particular mood or pastimes that we are attracted to spontaneously. And that's going to be the subject of another series on Raganuga Bhakti. So which form should we worship? If we prefer directing our feelings of dualistic devotion towards our mental image of God is sufficient. However, the aim of all forms of devotional practice, whether performed by mind, speech, or body, is to focus our love upon the one absolute reality that we call God. Now, the only reason we see a difference between ourself and God is that we are in duality. We're in dualistic consciousness. So we need to explain, how did this world come into existence? <laughs> so we need this God. We need this concept. We need this object of worship. And that's fine, whichever one we want to pick and choose and whichever mode of worship is just fine 
for us. Since our love is usually dissipated as innumerable desires for external objects or experiences, it is easier for us to withdraw it from all other external things by focusing it upon a definite name or form that we identify as God, rather than by trying to focus it upon a less definite concept of God. We don't want to focus on the concept. We want to focus on the actual God. So, how to do that? Well, we assign a form and a name, and not necessarily the same name or form that any other person might assign to God. And that's all right. So we have to pick which form of God is right for us. And after a long search, I finally found our Nachula, and I'm very happy with that. Knowing that it is easier for an habitually extroverted human mind to focus its love upon a definite name and form rather than a vague concept, Sri Bhagavan exemplified the practice of dualistic devotion by praising and praying to God in the name and form of Arunachala Hill. Because that was his innate nature. And he was already cognizant of his inward nature as the self. So he was drawn to Arunachala as a perfect expression of that. Though God is omnipresent, we cannot actually experience him as such while we see this world of manifold objects and mistake it to be real. Everything is a form of God because he is the one real substance that appears as all this multiplicity. But thinking thus will tend to dissipate our mind rather than to focus it upon one point. And that's the crucial practice that leads to realization, focusing the whole mind on one point. Why is that? Because the mind is naturally distracted and scattered, and our attention, our consciousness, is divided among many, many different objects. So in order to realize the self, we have to focus it on one thought, one object. Then we can even get rid of that object and become the self. So everything is a form of God. That is first path realization. And when we reach that, it's quite dramatic. We can actually experience this, that everything is a form of God. It's very wonderful. But it takes a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of sadhana to get there. Therefore, to prevent our mind from being dissipated by this illusion of multiplicity, it is helpful to focus our love and attention upon one name and form of God that particularly attracts us. It is true that worshiping God in the form of a mountain may not appeal to all people, but that is not the point. The aim of worshiping God is to gain true love for our natural state of absolutely peaceful, infinitely happy being. So when one realizes this being, oh, this is the best. This is better than Nibbana. <laughs> Actually, it is Nibbana. Nirvana means to realize that I am that supreme consciousness and nothing else. And to reside in that, to dwell in that. And the Buddha called this pleasant abiding. So to abide in that consciousness, to relax into it, to be at home in it, uh, is the most wonderful thing. But while the body exists, one must also come out of that state. And in that dualistic state, then one worships God as an external form and name. But in whatever form we wish to worship God, whether by mind, speech, or body, we can learn much to help, guide, and inspire us in our spiritual practice 
by meditating deeply upon the example and meaning of Sri Bhagavan's devotional verses. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the following series. So <laughs> thank you very much for your interest in this devotion to Arunachala. Please try it. Chant this Arunachala Dhyana Mantra and see what happens. Huh? Not just for 15 or 20 minutes like that guy I met on the beach, but try it for an hour or a day. Huh? Just sit down, empty your mind, and concentrate on this mantra and see what happens. It may be very subtle, but it's bound to be beneficial. So, thank you very much, and we'll see you in the next series on Bhakti Rasa. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum. Aruna Chalashivam Yidam.